Okay, so everyone by now has heard about the erythritol study and how they basically imply that consuming erythritol can put you at a heightened risk of heart attacks, strokes and other adverse cardiac events. I've read the study and I've also watched other videos flood in from Dr. Eric Berg, Thomas DeLauer and Dr. Lane Norton, where they pull the study apart and collectively point to this being a case of reverse causality, where basically the very fact that this study was based on unhealthy individuals and that erythritol is produced in the body as a byproduct of glucose processing and in response to oxidative stress, they felt that the increased erythritol displayed in people who experienced major adverse cardiovascular events was not necessarily from exogenous sources, but from endogenous sources as a result of the body's response to being unwell. And they landed at this conclusion quite rightly because the study did not assess or even record whether the participants were consuming erythritol exogenously from food and drink sources, aside from the final part of the study, which I'll explain shortly. So they published a study with the fundamental message to people being, be careful about consuming erythritol, since we've proven that it increases your risk of heart attacks, without actually determining whether the correlation they found in their study between elevated erythritol levels and the risk of major adverse cardiac events was the result of the participants consuming erythritol or whether it was the result of other factors with erythritol levels being a result of, not the cause of, these increased risk factors. Now, the question for me then becomes, since the study authors missed this key piece of information and it's raised doubts about the legitimacy of the findings, how do we use the data that the study provides team it with data from other studies regarding erythritol and endogenous versus exogenous blood levels and figure out for ourselves were the participants in this study clearly consuming a lot of erythritol laden food and drink or were their elevated erythritol levels purely the result of endogenous production due to their unhealthy lifestyles. I did some digging on this and the results were eye-opening. So this recent study titled The Artificial Sweetener Erythritol and Cardiovascular Event Risk, which was published at the end of February 2023, shows the baseline blood levels of erythritol in the study participants and split this data to show how erythritol blood levels compared between those that suffered major adverse cardiac events over a three-year period and those who did not. Those who suffered from a major adverse cardiac event over a three year period had a median baseline erythritol blood level of around 1.7 micromoles per litre of blood. Whereas those who did not suffer a major adverse cardiac event had a baseline level of around 1.55 micromoles per litre. Now, you might say, okay, that's around a 9% difference. You could argue that this may be statistically relevant but not when you look at how an exogenous form of erythritol affects blood levels of erythritol. I found another study titled Erythritol is a pentose phosphate pathway metabolite and associated with adiposity gain in young adults, which examined the effects of ingesting around 50 grams of erythritol, which for context is not an uncommon amount to find in the average serving size of beverages or confectionery that use erythritol in the place of sugar. It found that erythritol blood levels peaked around 100 minutes after initial ingestion, rising from a level close to zero. They don't actually specify what the baseline value is, it's, and it's difficult to see from the graph, uh, but it goes to a huge value of 5,500 nanomoles of, of erythritol per liter of blood. Now, let's just put that into context. That's 3,235 times higher than the baseline blood levels shown in the artificial sweetener erythritol and cardiovascular event risk study. In fact, the study itself basically confirms a drastic effect that exogenous erythritol has on blood levels of erythritol when in the very final part of the study, they took a grand total of eight participants and gave them exogenous erythritol in the form of a beverage that contained 30 grams of erythritol and noted that it increased their blood levels of erythritol 1000 fold which seems to sit in line with the results shown in the other study just mentioned, since this was a smaller dose of erythritol at 30 grams rather than the 50 grams ingested in the earlier mentioned study. So you'd expect a rise in blood levels of around this amount. The study also mentioned that erythritol blood levels remain in a noticeably elevated state for two to three days thereafter. So what does this all prove? Well, it basically proves that the vast majority, if not all, participants in this highly flawed study 
were not regular consumers of exogenous erythritol, since if they were, you'd have expected at least one or two to have consumed something with it in, within the th two to three day window prior to having their baseline bloods checked. And if they did, they'd flag as a very obvious outlier on the range. But as we can see, the range only extends to around four nanomoles per liter in the US cohort and five nanomoles per liter in the European one which by the way, I haven't explained this yet, but they split the study across people living in Europe and people living in the US, uh, hence the two separate cohorts of participants. But that compares with the maximum range of 5,500 nanomoles per litre uh, when you consume a beverage with erythritol in it. With this in mind, I'd confidently estimate that none of the participants in this study regularly consume food and beverages that contain significant levels of erythritol. So the underlying message that the media have led these findings with is highly misleading. They're basically telling people to be careful about consuming erythritol on the basis of a study that analyzed people who clearly don't even consume it themselves. The study is flawed in so many ways, many of which have already been thoughtfully highlighted by Thomas DeLauer, Dr. Eric Berg, and Dr. Lane Norton. But I just wanted to see if we could answer the only thing that left a thread of credibility to this study, and that was an assumption that the participants were consuming exogenous forms of erythritol. And as I've just shown, they clearly weren't. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the content. It showed me how difficult it is to say erythritol several times over. Uh, if you enjoyed the content, please go ahead and subscribe. You can do that here. You can also do it beneath the video. And don't forget to also hit the bell symbol when you do so you can be notified of any new health and wellness videos that we post. Thanks for watching.